Hamiltonians. Hamilton. Hamilton. Good morning. Morning. Paging Hamilton. Someone is paging Hamilton Gambaro to the front of the sanctuary. And Damien. Hamilton Gambaro paging to the front of the sanctuary. There he goes. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Father's Day. It's Father's Day today, and we have a few treats for you, so we'll get to that momentarily. But thank you for being here. Thank you for making your way to your seats. Appreciate that. And uh, if you're online with us, we're glad that you chose to join us that way as well. Now, when you're online, uh, you're not with people, so try to make that as connected as possible. So comment to one another and things like that. Uh, you can also use it as a, a tool to share and invite somebody else to join us virtually into the service as well. If you're in the building, you can uh, use, we have invitational cards in the back, on the back table. You can, it's a picture of uh, people from the church in front of it. You can take that, hand that out to as many people as you'd like, invite people to, to join us and be a part of what God is doing here at Bethel Assembly of God. Uh, also, Wednesdays, uh, we were going to alternate, but we've decided on Wednesdays every week for at least for a season, we're going to have a uh, continuing discussion on how to be more fruitful as individuals and as a group. Uh, so that starts Wednesdays at 6.30 back in the back room. So anybody's welcome to be a part of that. I encourage you to come and participate in that. Uh, also, uh, there is an event called Pittsburgh Praise. That, or, yeah, Pittsburgh Praise. That's uh, July 10th. That's, a, that's a, a working together of multiple churches that are going to join together at Heinz Field on a Sunday afternoon to pray, uh, pray for our community and different things like that. Uh, so you can, you can Google it and find the website. There's a website for it as well. Uh, but that's July the 10th. It's a Sunday. Doors open at Heinz Field at 1, and then it's from 2 to 4. They'll have some special worship and things like that as well. Uh, so I encourage you to participate in that. Also, July 2nd, uh, we're going to have a men's bicycle ride. Uh, so, John, would you wave your hand back there? So, John's back back there. You wave a hand. There we go. That's John back there. Uh, if you're interested or have any questions, see him after service. He'd be glad to make sure to connect you for that. Uh, but that's... What's that? Uh, you guys have something coming soon, all right? We'll, we'll tell you. You have something coming, okay? You guys have stuff, too. But you guys, we're just, we're just, Valerie, we're just catching up. You guys have great things all the time. We, we got to catch up to you guys, right, John? <laughs> Yeah, all right, so we're going to do a bike ride on the North Shore. It's July 2nd, meet in the parking lot here at 9.30 a.m. Uh, also, our next Food and Fellowship is June 29th, uh, Wednesday night, June 29th at 6 p.m. Depending on weather, we'll meet outside like we usually do. Bring a side dish and a dessert and a friend with you so that we can just hang out and have some, some fun with each other and eat some good food. Uh, also, next Sunday, we're going to have water baptism. So if you have yet to follow the Lord in water baptism, if you've committed your life to following the Lord, one of his commandments is to, to you to demonstrate that in the form of water baptism before others, and we're doing that next Sunday. So if you've not done that, it doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, you, could, you could be anywhere, uh, old or young. Uh, if you have not done that yet, I encourage you to do that. Just come and see me or contact me. If you're new, you should have something that has my cell phone number on it contact me and I'd be glad to, to get you connected for next Sunday. Now, if you would stand with me and let's turn our attention to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege to be in your house. We thank you for the gifts that you give us primarily in salvation and, and the working of the Holy Spirit, but also in the people of God that you've surrounded us with and the gifts that they are to us and the things they do. And we ask, Lord, as we draw our attention to you, that you would dwell in this place, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit among us, that you would uh, change us and transform us, encourage us, do a great thing in our midst, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we have uh, a, few God, a few dads that are going to uh, sing a special song for us for Father's Day. Uh, so that's the reason for the, the blue shirts as well. So, uh, guys, if we would. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you uh, were blessed when you had 
your father here on this earth, uh, someone you could look up to, someone who looked out for you, someone who helped develop you. Uh, not everyone is that lucky. Sometimes y y your image of a father isn't necessarily as good as someone else's. But uh, I think one thing we can all agree on is that our Heavenly Father is someone who can be worshipped, someone who we can rejoice in, someone who we can say thank you to for everything that he's done. And um, that's what this song uh, is entitled, I Thank God. Let's give him praise.
You turn me around. You place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master and I thank the Savior because you heal my heart. You change my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Oh, I thank God. I thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. thanks and we give you praise thank you lord that we can sing that hell has lost another one lord because you have set us free and the one that the sun sets free we can rejoice is free indeed lord that's what your word tells us hallelujah Jesus. And out of pain I see rejoicing. For you rise out of brokenness. He takes your brokenness. You rise out of brokenness. And I will dance in the midst of the fire. And I will sing in the eye of the storm. And I will shout, you are faithful. The victory is mine, cause the battle is yours. Oh, I will dance in the midst of the fire. I will sing in the eye of the storm. I will shout, you are faithful forever. The victory is mine, cause the battle is yours. The victory is mine, cause the battle is yours the victory is mine because the battle is yours hallelujah hallelujah thank you Jesus Lord we give you thanks we give you praise Lord one of the last things you said Lord when you were on the cross is it is finished Lord, we know there are battles that we need to go through. We, Lord, we know that you will never leave us or forsake us, Lord. But, Lord, we also know that the victory is won because you have been victorious. Lord, you arose again from the dead, which demonstrated that you are who you said you were. 
that you did what you said you came to accomplish, Lord, you accomplished that. Thank you, Jesus. Because if I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause. Because I feel much like a lost cause. And if I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. I would have labeled me beyond repair. Because I feel like I'm beyond repair. But let me tell you, oh, but somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. Because you're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. Hallelujah. Whole world walks away. You're the God who stays with wide open arms. You tell me that nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who stays. Thank you, Jesus. I used to hide every time I thought I'd let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way, but I'm learning you don't work that way. Hallelujah. And that somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. Because you're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stays. With wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I separate my heart from the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. Can you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God Declare this with me today, that my shame can't separate my guilt, can't separate my past, can't separate, I'm yours forever, no. separate my scars, can't separate my failures, can't separate He's the God who stays. He's the God who stays. He's the one who runs in your direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who Who's the God who stays? He's the one who runs in our direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. Can he tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who stays? Oh, God, I'm so thankful that you stay. God, I'm so thankful that your mercies are new every morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you glory. Blessing, honor, strength, and power. Yours alone now and forever. We 
give you praise. Because love this world could never stop. There is no one like our God reaching down to touch the broken. Mercy breaking through this moment. Faithful. Faithful is the one who saves. Worthy is your name. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise and the glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. Throngs of angels, throngs of angels watch and wonder on that day when time is over, when every heart at last proclaims, worthy is your name. Oh God, come on, give him praise. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. In your name we rise, and the glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come, and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. And the glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh, there's no one like our God. Let's give him praise. Come on. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone, anything like you. is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. The glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise. And the glory is yours. The glory is yours. Nobody beside you. There has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you. There again. If you have a prayer need, we invite you to come forward. As we stand before our God and worship Him, I remember those melodies, the words we sang when I first believed, songs of redemption, Stories of hope, heaven awakened inside my soul. And I sang in Christ alone, he's my solid ground, amazing grace, oh how sweet the sound on that rugged cross. 
cross. My Jesus paid it all because he lives. This is my song. Peace like a river, love so divine. Those words kept singing through the darkest nights. Sweet hymns of freedom, anthems of praise. Remind my heart to trust his name. Cause in Christ alone, he's my solid ground. my solid ground amazing grace oh how sweet the sound on that rugged cross Jesus paid it all because he lives this is my song this is my story cause this is my story this is my song hallelujah praising my savior all the day long blessed assurance glory divine oh hallelujah jesus is mine this is my story this is my story this is my song praising my savior prayer of our lips. The praise of our lips, Lord, is an offering of praise to you. Lord, we welcome your spirit here among us, Lord, to do your work, to change us, Lord, and to mold us. Thank you, Jesus. Everything 
as it was meant to be. And we will worship, worship forever in your presence. We will sing, we will worship, worship you. Hallelujah to the King. I will see, and I will see you as you are, and love you with unsinning heart. And I'll see how much you paid to bring me home. Not till then, Lord, shall I know. Not till then, just how much I owe, and everything I am before your throne. And we will worship, worship forever in your presence. We will sing, and we will worship. There'll be no more tears, no more tears, no more shame, no more sin and sorrow ever known again, no more fears, no more pain, we will see you face to face. praise forever in your presence we will sing and we will worship oh we'll worship you with an endless hallelujah to the king we'll sing an endless hallelujah to the king sing an endless hallelujah to the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on in your own words, just express to you, express to the Lord what he means to you. Hallelujah. Lord, you are everything. Hallelujah. As we sang earlier, Lord, you're the one who loves and stays even when we fail and are broken down. You're the one that gives forgiveness and grace. Thank you, Lord, for that. You're the one who restores. You're the one who doesn't leave us in that place of brokenness and failure, but you lift us out of that pit. Thank you for that. You're the only one that's always with us, that never leaves us or forsakes us. Thank you for that. You're the only one that understands us and gets us. Thank you for that. You know us down to the core. You know us better than we know ourselves, Lord. Thank you for that. You're the only one who has all the answers. You're the only one that knows when to give them and when not to give them. Thank you for that. You're the only one that can make us feel a certain way. You're the only one that can empower us to do certain things. Thank you for that, Lord. And you are the only one, Jesus, you are the only one by which men must be saved. You're the only hope. You're the only avenue to eternal life. The only one. And we thank you for that. 
We thank you for your willingness to dwell with us and work in our lives. We thank you for your willingness to draw us together, to create people and gift people and put them in our lives. We thank you for that. We thank you for the, the incompleteness and the, and the flaws of the people you've placed into our lives, Lord. They demonstrate for us how great your, great is, your grace is. They demonstrate for us how we can be accepted because we are filled with flaws and brokenness. And we ask, Lord, on this day, as we, as we turn to your word, as we get ready to give, after that, as we continue to, to fellowship before we go, that, that you would be at work in us, Lord, that you would reveal to us many things, that you would open our eyes to see what we need to see, Lord. You would open our eyes to see the way you see that you would soften our hearts to feel the way you feel and our minds renew them so that we can think the way you think. Be at work with us. We open ourselves to you that you would have your way. We thank you for your persistency, Lord. We thank you for that. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you. You could be seated. Amen. He is faithful, isn't he? Amen. If the ushers would come and prepare to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings this morning, and as they prepare to come, if you're online with us this morning, you can give that way. There should be a link available to you. If you're here, you're also able to give online. Uh, we thank you for your generosity. It's a, it's a choice. You know, nobody makes you give. You can choose to give, and uh, it's, it's a choice that you make, and it's, uh, it's a generous one that you have made week after week, and we greatly appreciate your financial con contributions in helping us do what we do. Uh, so, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for the gift that's about to be given, and we ask that you would bless it. You would help me and the leadership team to use it well to further your kingdom and bring honor to you and, and to touch other people's lives. And those that give, Lord, that you would demonstrate yourself faithful, that you would provide for their ever needs despite releasing some to you. We trust in you with this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, gentlemen. If you would turn with me to Ezra chapter 3 this morning. And you should have a, a basic outline handout. If you do not, just raise your hand and someone will come along. So we got a few. Uh, so those will be coming to you. Just keep your hand up. Someone will bring that to you. Ezra chapter 3. Go into Ezra chapter 3 this morning. Again, you have a handout there. And again, like we were saying last week, I think some of us are patient to some degree. Did anybody feel like you're, you're patient a little bit? Okay, I'm patient some. You can tolerate some, okay? Uh, so we're patient to some degree, and we don't expect everything to be perfect. You know, we don't expect everything to work out exactly like we'd hope all the time. But when it begins to get frustrating is when nothing seems to be working out. Or when there seems to be no progress at all. You know, like you're trying to improve your, your financial situation and you're okay that it's taking some time and you're okay that it's, it's not happening quickly. But you just want to see some progress, right? You just want to see some movement in the right direction. Maybe it's your relationships or your health. Uh, isn't that irritating? The older you get, it's like I keep going backwards. You know, the body just, just doesn't get better. It keeps getting worse. Your relationships, like I said, more importantly, your spiritual growth and well-being and, and the advancement of God's kingdom, or maybe the, the spiritual uh, state of your children. And you're okay if they're not perfect, right? You know, we love our kids. We're okay if they're not perfect. But we just want to see some progress, right? Some movement in the right direction. And that's what makes us frustrated is when there's no progress, so what do we do with that? You know, is there something we can do to make sure that more progress happens? Does God even care about that? And, and I believe he does. And we see that begin to happen in the book of Ezra. And we'll eventually move into the book of Nehemiah. But 
the first step, and even today the second step, is kind of confusing because when you think, let's make progress, so like if you have a room in your house, have you ever had children that you have a room in your house? Like just the other day, we have a room in our house that's just torn apart because I don't know what happens. You know, you just, when you have four kids, you blink, and all of a sudden everything's chaos, you know. And so there's a room in a house, and I've been slowly working on getting it better. And so it's our dining dining room. And on the dining room table, there's just a load of stuff on there because I'm trying to just move everything out and start to get it reorganized. And the other day I asked, I won't name which child, one of the children to to clean their area. I was going to say the gender, and that would narrow it down too. But uh, their area, and, and I caught, I caught out of the corner. No, I didn't catch when it happened. I noticed that one of the things that was in this person's area made its way onto the dining room table. Because in this person's mind, they thought, well, there's so much stuff there, he won't notice if I just shove it all on there, and that'll get my job done quickly. And then that makes me see that now there's, instead of moving forward, I'm moving backwards. You know, more stuff is, how is more stuff getting on this table? And we love our kids. We just want to see some progress, right? We just, we don't want the room to look perfect. We just want to see it just move in the right direction, all right? Let me just see a little space on the carpet in your room, okay? Just, just one little space. And it's like that in life, isn't it? I just, I don't need perfect, just progress, okay? But again, the first two steps that we see with Ezra is confusing to us because when you think, like cleaning that room, when you think, if I'm going to make progress, what am I going to do? I'm going to do some work on that room, right? If we're going to make progress, I need to start doing something. It's not going to happen if I just sit back and pray that God will clean the room for me. You know, as much as that would be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful if you just prayed and God just cleaned the house and did the laundry for you? But we know that it doesn't happen that way. So, so we know that you have to do work. But the first step to be able to make progress in life is to do nothing. That's confusing. And if you missed that last week, you can go back on online and check that out. The first step is to be content. Just be okay with the way things are. Now, how in the world am I going to make progress by doing nothing? Because sometimes in life, when we do stuff, and we're doing stuff, sometimes we're doing stuff all the time. Have you ever been doing so much stuff, and eventually you stop and you think, what is this stuff that I'm doing? Does this stuff even matter? Is this stuff even doing anything? Why am I so busy? Okay, and it's because sometimes we are working hard and we're trying to make things happen, but we're doing the wrong things. We're doing the things that aren't helping the progress, or we're trying to progress to a place that God hasn't designed us to progress to. And we won't see that if we're so busy trying to make something happen. And so when we step back and we decide to be content and okay with the way things are, and we relax a little bit, anybody ever have a hard time relaxing? Okay, you're just always uptight, you know, everything's, you know, there's always things that have to get done. Just relax, chill out, breathe, pray, think about life, enjoy life, settle on some of your passions sometimes. You know, sometimes you're just so passionate that certain things that just settle down. And in the midst of that contentment, you might start to see that there are things that you're doing that have no value, they don't matter. And you might start to see there's things that you're not doing that have value. And you might start to figure out what you should be doing with today and then begin to discover, discover progress. But the second one, and this is something that personal experience for me, you know, part of the things that are going on in, in my household with, you know, part of it is my health, but that's just part of what you know. We, and you know that we have kids that are crazy, and there's different things that are okay, and some things that are not okay with that, and you, there's a lot you don't know. And then in pastoring a church, I tell you some things, and some things I don't. It's not that I keep secrets. It's just sometimes there's things that you don't need to know. You know, some things you don't know, you don't need to know what this person's dealing with. You know, I know. And as I wrestle with life and stuff, there's times that in life you just want to give up on certain things. Have you ever been there before? This is just, you just want to give up on that relationship. You know, I'm just t- I just tried, I tried to do all the different things, and, and I've, I've tried to stick with it, and it's just, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with that. Or sometimes you have... Uh, you're trying to get your life put together, whether it's financially or spiritually or whatever, and, and you've tried, right? You've put a lot of effort into it. You've done different things. You've read the books, and you've, you've watched the YouTube videos, and you listen to the podcast, and you listen to the sermons, and you've done all the stuff, and you're just done, right? You're just tired. I'm tired of doing it, okay? Have you ever been there before? 
or, so, or, or a principle that you're trying to live by. You're trying to live this way, and you try your best, and then you just you keep failing at it. And so you just at some point you just decide I'm done. And, you know, I'm, I'm giving up on this, and we end up being quitters. Do you ever get tired of being a quitter? Do you ever get tired of tried this new thing and you quit on it? You tried this new thing and you quit on it. You tried to do this or try to live this way and you quit on it. Do you ever just get tired of quitting? And sometimes I wonder, maybe we're not making progress because we keep quitting. Well, how do I stop that? And today's Father's Day, and I've said this numerous times over the years that I've passed. Can you believe it's been over five years? Boy, that went by fast. But over the five years that I've been here pastoring, I've, I've mentioned off and on on Father's Day that I've often disliked what is commonly, what commonly happens in church, on churches on Father's Day. On Mother's Day, we usually say, mothers are great, they're wonderful, we love you guys, you do everything. On Father's Day, you guys need to shape up, all right? You guys need to get better and get your act together. This usually happens on Father's Day. And to a point, there's a reason for that. And it's, it's not legitimate how extreme that goes. And I've resisted doing that. But the reason why I think that happens is because us men, we tend to be quitters. Now, let me, let me, hear me out for a minute. Here's the way we tend to be quitters. We like to succeed, okay? We like to be good at stuff. And when we figure out we're not good at it, you know what we do? We tend to find something else to start doing. You know, that's why some dads decide that they're going to stop trying to do this parenting stuff. I'm just going to go out in the garage or I'm just going to go, you know, I'm going to go hunting or do something else. And you want to take the kids with you? No, they can stay here. You just start to pull away because you start to realize you're struggling at doing the dad thing and, and you don't like failing. So you step back on it. Or same with the husband thing or, or your job or, you know, a lot of times guys will quit their job because they're just not good at it. And so I'm just quitting. And, and that happens. But dads aren't the only ones that are in that place, right, ladies? Ladies do the same thing. We try, and it gets hard, and we just quit. How do I stop doing that? How do I stop quitting? Because you certainly, if you think it's bad enough that you have to get content and wait and do nothing, in that, and that's going to cause you to not get progress, think about whether or not you quit all the time. You're not going to make progress if you keep giving up on it, right? Are you going to make progress if you keep giving up? But we keep doing it. How do we stop giving up all the time? Well, I think that Ezra in this third chapter is going to give us some principles or some examples to show us what we might be able to do to prevent giving up. Ezra chapter 3, look with me if you will. Ezra chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, with his fellow priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, with his kinsmen, and they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Verse 3, they set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening, and they kept the feast of booths, as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule each day as each day required verse 5 and after that the regular burnt offerings the offerings at the new moon and at the at all the appointed feasts of the lord and the offerings of everyone who had made free will offerings to the lord verse 6 from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord has, uh, was yet to be laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia, verse 8. Now in the second year, according or after their, their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, uh, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Joshua, with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God along with the sons of Hinnadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, 
The priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted shouted aloud with joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people weeping, for the people shouted with great a great shout, and the sound was heard far away." So what do we make of all this stuff that's, that's happening here? Now, things that we do in life, and we, we will do this when it comes to our endurance, so to speak, but we also do it in other areas of life. We do things, uh, we take preventative measures. Okay? Like when you brush your teeth, I hope you brush your teeth, when you brush your teeth and floss, do, do you ever go to the dentist and they say, have you been flossing? And it's that moment of great conviction, you know? once a year before I come see you. <laughs> or have you ever had those moments where like you have been flossing every day, you go to the city dentist and they say, have you been flossing? You're thinking, what, am I doing it wrong? <laughs> but you don't floss because there's something wrong, right? You don't brush your teeth and use mouthwash because, it, well, maybe you use it because you have bad breath, I don't know. But you don't typically do dental hygiene because there's something wrong. You do it as a preventative. You do it to prevent something from going wrong. You do that with your dental hygiene. You do that with other health things. You do that in your relationships. You do that with your finances. You know, you try to save, set money aside so that when something goes wrong financially, you have some money to kind of lessen the blow of that. We do a lot of different things to try to prevent things. But do you do anything in your life to try to prevent you from being a quitter? Do you take preventative measures to try to keep yourself from giving up on progress? Well, Ezra is going to show us that there are three preventatives to keep us from quitting on the things that God has called us to do. Now, there's two side ones that just mentioned in passing in addition to the three. And one is, did you notice that he said that they were gathering up the money and the resources? Okay, and you might remember this from chapter one. And I forgot to mention, we skipped over chapter two, not because it's not important, but because he was just numbering the groups of people and organizing the groups of people. It's very difficult to make a sermon out of that, okay? But that doesn't mean it's not important and it doesn't matter. So I encourage you to read it on your, uh, at your leisure at some point. But it says that they gathered the resources from where? Did anybody catch that? They got it from the grant that they received from Cyrus, not a Jew. He's not the king of the Jews. Cyrus was the king of Persia. So again, just like last week, they're utilizing resources that came from a source that wasn't even godly. And some of us, the reason why we're quitting is we don't have resources to do what God is calling us to do, to do the things we want to do. And we don't have resources because we're turning down resources. I don't know if you've ever been in that place or seen someone in that place. There are some people that are needy and struggling and help comes in and they turn it down. Because they don't like what it looks like, or they don't like what is expected of them. I I sometimes, when some people will come to me here for for benevolence requests, sometimes we just uh, give them the help, depending on the situation. Uh, But there's times if someone keeps coming over and over, asking for help, at some point, we start to have the discussion, hey, what's going on, you know, here? And we start... Uh, asking things, and I started asking some questions, and, and you know what usually happens at that point? I don't want your help anymore. You're asking too many questions, you know, and we do that. You know, I don't want help. I don't like that guy. I don't want him to help, or I don't want them to be able to say that they're the reason why I'm here. You know, I want to I prove that I could do it on my own, and then you find yourself struggling because you're rejecting help that's trying to come in, so one of the reasons why we quit is because we're, we're doing that. The other is, and this This always bothers me to say this. I don't know if you noticed in verse 8 that they're starting to get organized, right? They're starting to to give assignments and and get things together. And and, and I know that there's different types of people. Some of us are organized and organized to a fault. Let me me just tell you. Hamilton texted me, what was that, Thursday or Friday? Thursday or Friday, he texted me and said, you need to wear a blue shirt today. Now, I have a problem with that. And then the problem I have with that is I organize my clothes. And I already had a shirt ready for today. 
And so I was like, do I change and wear a blue shirt according to his request, or do I wear what was planned to wear that day? Because i got to keep things organized, okay? And so I, I was like, you know, I'm going to wear the shirt I had planned. What, kind, what shirt do I have planned? Oh, it is a blue shirt. And I was like, but it's a light blue shirt, and I bet everybody else is going to wear, like, regular blue or dark blue. And so maybe I should change to a, a darker blue or a regular blue. It's like, no, you know what? I'm going to wear the shirt that I'm going to wear. And then I get here, and most of the guys are wearing light shirts. So it works out. God help me not look so crazy until I told you what was going on there. <laughs> but I like things. And some of you are like me, right? Anybody like me? You like things, maybe not that extreme, but you like things to be organized. You like to get things organized. You like to plan things out and stuff. Some people are not like that, okay? Some people don't like to plan. In fact, they hate plans. They just don't plan things. Let's just do things on the spur of the moment, all right? And I don't need everything organized, you know. I, I like this to be a mess because I know how to find it in the mess, all right? So some people aren't like that way. And it's not a sin to be one way or the other. But here's the thing. Which direction you are uh, will decide what things you struggle with and what things you excel at, Okay. Now, when it comes to not being a quitter and when it comes to be, being persistent in pursuing the things that God has called you to do, you know what comes as a great resource? Being someone who's structured and organized and planned out. It just helps things along. And so someone like me, I can try to act like, because have you ever seen people act like, look at me, I'm all together and I got things figured out and that guy's a mess, but look at me, I'm planned out and structured. And they act as if they made it happen. Right? But where does it all come from? You know, God's the one that gifts us and wires us the way that we are. It says that some are the feet, some are the hand, and those kind of things like we said last week. So it's not that it's like I made it happen. So I need to recognize that it's easy for me. Okay, It's easy for me to, to do those things. That's great. And some of you it's not easy for, but that doesn't mean you don't need to do it. It's harder for you. And, and I feel the frustration for you because that must be irritating when, when structure and, and routine makes it work better. But sometimes we have to make adjustments in life, don't we? We have to adapt. Just like if you're, if you're an introvert, not an extrovert, that doesn't mean you're not supposed to have healthy relationships. Okay? That doesn't mean you're not supposed to be social to a degree. You might not end up like Heather or, or other uh, extroverts in our midst that, are, that like to talk, uh, but we need to, so, so we need to make adjustments. So some of the why you're quitting is because you just keep saying, well, I am who I am. You know, whether you're, you're not a timely person, you know, it's just I am who I am. No, you can make adjustments and, and change things. But those are just the two little things. So what are the big things? I want you to know what happens, what begins to happen in Ezra chapter 3. And this is actually curious to me because we're thinking progress. They remember here 70 years in captivity. Okay, I want you to imagine that. 70 years with no freedom. 70 years you're enslaved. 70 years, some of you were born into it. This is all you knew. And all of a sudden, the doors become open, and you're set free, and you're liberated. In 70 years that you've not been able to go to the house of worship, 70 years it's not really even been in existence. And now all of a sudden, you're here, you're in Jerusalem, and you're capable of building the temple and beginning to do things. And did you notice, did you notice that it says in verse 1, when the seventh month came? I want you to think about this for a second. You've been waiting 70 years, you get there, and notice it says the foundation had not been laid yet. Seven months, and they're not doing anything yet. They're not making progress. Why? Why aren't they making progress? You know what they were doing? They were sacrificing. They were offering sacrifices to God. They were worshiping. They were trying to make sure that they were uh, following the, the laws and doing all the things that they weren't able to do, and they began to do the important things, even, even to the degree that it says that they laid the altar despite that they were fearful of the other people groups around them because there were other nations that were a threat to them. And so it's not only the temple they needed to rebuild at some point, but remember, Nehemiah will come in and they will build the walls. And back then, the walls around the city were meant for security. Where like today, we have a military and a police force, and we have different things to try to gain some form of security. Back then, they built walls around their city. And so they weren't safe. They were under threat, and they were new back here. Other people were ruling, and they needed to get some things done. But before they did it, seven months before they did it. In fact, later in our chapter that we read, it said in the second year, they began to rebuild or build the foundation. Now, that doesn't mean that it was two years in. It was during the second year, so it could be, you know, one or over one year. But you think about this. When you want to make progress, how long do you wait? 
You know, when you went, want to get things changed, how long do you wait? Do you wait seven months? Do you wait a year? Do you wait two years? You start doing something about it, but they're waiting. Why? Because they recognize that there are some things in life that are more important than progress. That's infuriating to people who like to make progress. There are some things that are more important than progress, and those things are our relationship with and our faithfulness to the Lord and our faithfulness to live the way he calls us to live. And there are some people that will sacrifice being involved in the body of Christ because they have certain financial pursuits and they have to do certain things with their job and their career. And because of that, they aren't doing the important things. Well, what am I supposed to do? I need to make progress financially. Well, these guys really are under threat and they need and they make progress with the, the, the temple and with the walls. But they were waiting, trusting God that I need to make sure I do the essentials before I do those things. There are others of you that are sacrificing your relationship with your family for different pursuits that you have going on in your life because I just have to get this area right. I just have to make progress here. I have to do something about it, and that just takes up too much time. So I have to do these things, and you sacrifice your relationship with your families. You sacrifice your friendship. Some of you sacrifice your health because you just keep going and going and going and going. There's a reason why God gave us the Sabbath day. Didn't Jesus present that when he showed up on the scene? He said it was made for you guys because you need the rest. You need to take time out. That doesn't mean you need to be lazy. That doesn't mean you never exert yourself. But here's what happens. I don't know if you've ever been here before. When you decide that this has to happen, I have to make progress, and I'm not going to rest, and I'm not going to do these other things until that happens, and you go after that thing, and you push, and you push, and you push, and you might see a little progress. Maybe you succeed greatly, but at some point, you get to a place where you just don't have any energy anymore. Have you ever been there before? You, we call it, I got burnt out, right? I just, I, I can't do it anymore. Some of you have hit, hit that wall before. We just can't do it anymore. You know why you couldn't do it anymore? Because you weren't taking care of the important things that were necessary for you to still have the energy to keep going. You weren't resting. Well, how can I rest when there's so much to be done? You're going to burn out at some point. You're going to quit at some point if you don't rest. You just, I know from experience you will. If you don't have relationships, if you don't enjoy life, if you don't keep your relationship with God healthy, at some point you will lose the energy and you won't keep going. You will quit. And if you want to make sure that there's progress in your life, and it's, this is the thing that's so odd, is if you want to make sure there's progress in your life, that means that sometimes you need to take the progress and give it, kick it to the back seat and wait seven months. Wait a couple years because you aren't in a place to tackle that. There are so many, there are so many things on my to-do list that I want to accomplish in my life before I die. Anybody like that? You have a list, and it's not a bucket list. It's not like a, these fun things I want to do. These things you want to accomplish for the Lord list before you die. And there's a bunch of them that's sitting there that I'm doing nothing about it because I can't. I would not, I would, I would be ruined. I would mess myself up and other things in my life if I did it. I can't do those things right now. And some of you, you're quitting and you're beating yourself up and you're feeling guilt ridden because you're pushing yourself to do things while not taking care of the essentials. That's the first preventative. The second preventative, and this is again where it gets weird, because I, I don't know anybody, and I always mess up. I think it's the Mary, the Martha story, where it's, it's Mary that, that, that just kept cleaning everything up and stuff. No, see, I always get it wrong. It's Martha that's doing all the work, and Mary's just sitting there doing nothing at Jesus' feet, and Martha gets all upset because there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that have to get done. And, and I don't know if you're like me that, like, you know, at some point people just stop working. Have you ever been in a place where you're trying to get stuff done, they're trying to get stuff done, and then all of a sudden everybody around you stops, and you're like, how are we going to get this done if you all stopped? We need to keep going. We need to keep doing this stuff. And they just stop for some reason. Sometimes they just stop the play. Anybody have a hard time playing? Come on, anybody, anybody who confess? Anybody have a hard time playing? You just take life so seriously. You just have to keep working. You have a hard time just stopping and playing and enjoying life. Here's the weird thing that these guys did, okay? Seven months in, they finally get to doing so, some building of the altar. And then we're at least a year in, and they finally start laying the foundation. You think, all right, now we're going to get some work done, right? We laid the foundation, okay, so we're going to start working. You know what they did? They started celebrating, they stopped 
laughed again. And they started celebrating. Woohoo, look, we have a foundation. This is wonderful. Let's celebrate. Let's throw a party. Let's start worshiping. And you're thinking, all the workers are thinking, we're not done yet. Why are we celebrating? And here's the reason why. Have you ever, and again, it all feeds to this. Have you ever kept trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying? And at some point you realized, I'm miserable. Have you ever been there before? You thought, I'm doing all the work. I'm doing all the right things that I'm supposed to do. But I don't feel happy. I don't ever feel happy. I always feel mad. And it's because you're focused on the end result. We just have to get there. All right, I just have to get there. Same with your spiritual journey and, and your growth uh, with you and the Lord. I just have to get there. And you find yourself frustrated because you're never there. Did you know that? You're not, all the work is never done. It's not. It's not ever done. Your progress in any area of life, it's never done. You're never fully there. And if you're vested in that that's when I'm going to be happy, you're not ever going to be happy. And we miss the reality that we're not just meant to arrive at a destination. We're meant to be going to a destination. We miss that we're supposed to enjoy the progress that's happening. Okay, so, so you struggle with anger with your kids, as I do. Okay, and you struggle and try to not uh, have outbursts of anger. And you just want to you just want to make it for a whole month with not ever getting mad at your kids. I was just thinking about that for a minute. If you've had kids, that's that's difficult. That's hard. And some of you are thinking that's not hard. You probably didn't have kids <laughs> or you had that one kid that was easy. That's never caused any any problem or something. But and you try really hard. You make it about a day or two uh, because they were away at some camp. <laughs> and then they come home and for about an hour, you're good. And then you lose your mind, and then you're like, ah, oh, man, I just should give up on this. I can't do it, because you're focused on the destination rather than the progress. And sometimes we have to realize that they didn't know it, but on the inside, I really wanted to let them have it, but I didn't let them have it. And you know what you should do in that moment? Celebrate that you held yourself back for one moment. It was only for a day, but celebrate that a little bit of progress happened. They did that with the foundation. You're, you're thinking, I just got to get this, these spiritual devotion habits happening in my life. You know, I, just, I need to be praying and reading the Bible, and I try, and it just, just, just doesn't happen. And then, you know, I'm going to do it every day of the week. And then what happens is people do it, and they only did four out of the seven. And then they say, I should just give up. You know, I should just quit because I can't do it every single day. Why? Because we're focused on, the, on getting there rather than the progress. God actually enjoys being right with you in the midst of you making the progress. And so instead of doing that, if you read it one day out of the week, it doesn't mean we shouldn't keep progressing forward. One day out of the week, step back and celebrate. I read my Bible one day this week. Woohoo! And some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. But I'm telling you, if you want the emotional energy to keep progressing, you're going to have to celebrate every minor, small step that you make. Well, that's going to take forever if I keep stopping and celebrating. Who wins, the hare or the tortoise? Okay. So you can decide that you're going to sacrifice sleep and you're going to sacrifice rest and you're going to sacrifice enjoyment, celebration. You're going to sacrifice your relationships. You're going to sacrifice your health. You're going to sacrifice all. We, we, we're like that as Americans. We're going to sacrifice. We're going to pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and we're going to make it happen. And you start running out the gate like that hare and you just start flying down the road and the tortoise is just, you know, moving a little bit and celebrating, moving a little bit and resting. And, and you're thinking, boy, look, I'm, I'm flying past that guy. But eventually the tortoise ends up walking. It's like, it's like, have you ever been driving in the middle of a snowstorm down the highway? We did this on numerous times on Interstate 70. You're going down the highway and you're going like 50, 40, you're like 20 miles under because you're, like you're feeling yourself sliding a little bit. And you see that guy in a sports car that just goes flying down the road. And you're like, wow, he's going to get there before I do. Not, because eventually you find that same guy on the side of the road because he's spun out and now he's stuck and now he's, you're just you're slowly passing him. Okay? And it's like that with progress. You feel like you're getting somewhere because you're going real fast. But you're going to burn out and fly off the road at some point. You need to stop and celebrate so that you can keep yourself motivated to keep going forward. Then the third one, this is the last one, this is the puzzling one. It's, it's interesting. Did you notice at the end there that there were two different reactions to the same thing? Okay. 
the foundation is laid. Okay, we've been 70 years away from this. Even the ones who lived long enough to be there when they left, and now they're back. We've waited 70 years, and now the foundation is finally laid, and some of them were celebrating, like I had said, and some of them began weeping. Did you see that? Some of them began mourning at the sight of it because they, they could remember the day when there was this glorious temple that was there, and they were comparing Okay, they were comparing where they used to be and where they are today, and where they used to be is better than where they are today. And we do that comparison game all the time, don't we? We might not like to admit it, but we do. We compare ourselves to ourselves, where we are today and where we were. I mean, if you're comparing your body now to where you were when you were 25, <laughs> you're miserable, <laughs> most of us. You know. <laughs> Are you comparing your finances to where you were before inflation, before COVID? You know, comparing the political situation now to, as if there weren't political craziness in the 60s and those other times too, but we do that comparison. We compare ourselves to others, you know, where I am spiritually compared to that person. You know, it's the worst. You are in a certain place spiritually. You've been following the Lord 10, 15, 20 years. And that guy just gets saved. And six months later, that guy's further along than you. Isn't that irritating? Okay. Or you've been working years getting your house situated and getting your house in order. And then someone moves in next to you. A young guy moves in next to you. Before you know it, his house is looking way better than yours. And he's working a full-time job and you're retired. And you're thinking, what, what gives? You know, are you, you're parenting and your kids, you're having a hard time. And you see those other people with their kids. And you think, why can't my, why can't my kids be like their kids? Okay? Or some of you, why can't my husband be like that husband? You know, why can't why my wife be like that? And we do the comparison game. And you know what? That's not, a, that's not a good game sometimes. And here's the thing. Here's why they were reacting differently is because they had the same point A, they had a di or same point B, but they had a different point A. They had a different starting point that they were looking at. And so they're looking, and one's looking from the perspective of how great it used to be. And we do that sometimes here at Bethel, don't we? We think of Bethel in the 90s and Bethel in the 80s and 70s when, when God was really moving and the place was packed and there were all kinds of programs and there was uh, 18 pastors on staff. No, there was never 18, but there was more. And there's all these resources and stuff. And we look at back at the glory days and we look at today and sometimes some of you, it's hard to celebrate. Like, think about this for a moment. Think about when we came out of COVID, the amount of people that were in the sanctuary and where we are today, okay? And that goes back and forth and back and forth. But if you're always focused on, because I was getting irritated during some of that season, because I was comparing what was happening pre-COVID to what was happening co post-COVID, and my point A was not a good starting point. And it was miserable, and it was sad, and it was disappointing. And if you want to know how to, to not, because you're going to kill yourself. If you keep looking at the better days instead of today, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to be miserable. The reason why some of you are so depressed is because you're thinking about your 25-year-old body. Okay? You're thinking about when things used to be good. You're thinking about when society used to be different. You're so focused on when it was better rather than today. What does Jesus say? Don't worry about uh, tomorrow. Worry about today. What does Paul say? I'm forgetting what lies behind and pressing on towards what is ahead. Stop focusing on the bad location unless, unless, sometimes some of us think that if we ignore the emotion and we ignore what we're struggling with, it just evaporates and goes away. Emotions don't work that way. So if you're mad and you just, I'm just going to shove it over in this corner box over there, and I'm not going to get angry because it's shoved over there. It doesn't go away. Just when you get the right prick, all of a sudden it's right back there. Or the sadness or the pain, the emotional pain that you have over whatever it was that you suffered and went through, you think, if I just shove it over in that box over there and pretend it doesn't exist, I won't feel that pain anymore. And it just keeps showing up, doesn't it? You know why? Because you didn't decide to face your pain before you moved on. And see, I don't know what to do with this ending here because, you know, it's interesting. And, and I try not to do this, but sometimes preachers will take a passage and they'll, they'll say how God felt about it. But did you notice something about this chapter? God didn't tell us who responded incorrectly. Did you notice that? There's not a word in there that says they should have celebrated rather than mourning. 
There's not a word in there that says they should have mourned instead of celebrating. God didn't say anything. And I tend to think that's because that in some way, both responses were appropriate. Because there's some of you that are angry and hurting and struggling because you didn't let yourself face the thing that you went through. And you've given up on life. You keep failing because you think, I'm just supposed to be happy. You know, don't we do that in Christian community sometimes? Rejoice in the Lord always. So that means I should be happy all the time about everything. Don't we do that with some hyper-spiritual name it, claim it people? No, don't. I love it when someone, when I'm sick, and pre-COVID, because now when you're sick, you're never around anybody. But when you're sick, you know, have a cold or whatever, and then I say to someone, yeah, I have a cold, and someone says to me, don't say that. As if me admitting that I had a cold is what gave me the cold. It showed up before I admitted it, by the way, but anyway. But we're like that. We're like, no, 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 no. don't. Just pretend like you're not sad, okay? Just, just pretend like you're happy. Have anybody ever tried to do that? That's not a good prescription for joy. It, does, it just doesn't happen, right? So you need to do both responses. We need to, when we're hurting, when we're angry, we need to face that anger, I'm telling you, it feels so much better when you go to the person and kindly and gently with respect and you talk through, hey, I'm mad at you because. I'm angry. That bothered me because. Maybe it shouldn't have. You know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I even reacted wrong. But this is why that bothered me. And you go and you talk to them about it. Boy, you feel so much better than if you just pretend like, I just don't want to, you hate conflict. I just don't want to talk about that. You know, I just don't want to deal with that. You feel so much better because you dealt with the emotion. But some of us decide that because it's important to deal with the emotions, we decide to drop everything forever and just stay in our emotions. We never recover. And God doesn't want us in either of those places. Will you stand with me? Worship team, will you come and prepare to lead us? God doesn't want us in either of those places. And Joe, if we can do the God who stays, I think it's a fitting song for what we're discussing this morning. So you're here this morning, and you're possibly coming at this from one of two angles. One of the angles is you quit. I don't know what it is you gave up on. Maybe you quit praying for that thing. Because it just wasn't happening. You gave up on humanity and people because they're disappointing. You gave up on getting your life together. You gave up on your marriage. You gave up on your children. You gave up on your parents, your health. You know, sometimes some of us are unhealthy because of things outside of our control. Sometimes we're unhealthy because we just completely gave up on our body. And just might as well just let it go. Maybe it's your spiritual walk with the Lord. I don't know what it is. But you quit. And you can begin leading, leading us. But you quit. That's why it's not different today for you. Because you gave up. Well, what was I supposed to do? Not quit. Doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to get there overnight. But that's part of the joy. You know, part of the joy is making the progress. Part of the joy is the journey and not just getting there. And you quit. And today's the day you need to repent of giving up on whatever that thing was. And you need to come down here and ask the Lord to help you to get back up on your feet and go again. That's one angle. Let's go ahead and begin playing. The other angle is you haven't quit yet, but you're thinking about it. Or you haven't quit yet, and you're not thinking about it. But as you're thinking about the things you should be doing, I know it's hard to find a way to enter in. Oh. Oh, is it the sound gone? Oh. I'm blaming the wrong person. <laughs> it's all right. There we go. There we go. We've been delivered. It sounded good in my ear. <laughs> Some of us... We're not thinking of quitting. We haven't quit. We're not even considering it. But when you started to think about the preventatives and the things that should be happening in your life, those essentials, 
Some of you think you're good enough all by, your, by yourself. You're good enough alone. God didn't intend it. It's not good for man to be alone. Did he say that? And some of you are starting to recognize that you're not thinking about quitting now, but boy, have you set the stage in motion for you to quit sometime in the near future. And you need to come down to these altars of repenting of not doing the essential stuff. Whatever reason that you stop doing those things. And allow the Lord to come and work in you because we need his energy, don't we? Because it's hard. This life has a way of beating us down. We need his energy. And I'm telling you that he is the God who is uh, without limits and can empower us to keep persisting and not giving up. And even if you had, I love the verse that says a righteous man falls seven times. But do you know why he's righteous? He keeps getting back up. You know, failure is not because you messed up or you lost it for a moment. Failure is if you stop trying, if you give up on the journey. And some of you have. Some of you are set up to give up on it. And you need to come down, right? They're going to lead this song for us, and the words are appropriate. Let's let them change us. Let's let us get it back, this back on the right track this morning. Come and seek Him. Come and seek Him, Lord. Come and seek the Lord. He wants to help you. Come on. Come and seek Him. If I were you, I would have given up on me by now. I would have labeled me a lost cause. Cause I feel just like a lost cause. If I were you, I would have turned around and walked away. I would have labeled me beyond repair. Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair. But somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still God who stays, you're the God who stays, you're the one who runs in my direction, when the whole world walks away, you're the God who stays, with wide open arms, and you tell me nothing I have ever done, could separate my heart from the God who time I thought I'd let you down. I always thought I had to earn my way, but I'm learning you don't work that way. Oh, but somehow you don't see me like I do. Somehow you're still here. You're the God who stays. You're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away. You're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God who stays. Because my shame can't separate. My guilt can't separate. My past can't separate oh i'm yours forever and my sin it can't separate and my scars can't separate my failures can't separate i'm yours forever no enemy can separate there's no power of hell that can take away your love for me it will never change i'm yours Cause he's the God who stays. He's the God who stays. He's the one who runs in my direction. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stays with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from the God. Tell me nothing I have ever done could separate my heart from.
from the God who stays. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you that you, you stick with us even when we've given up on ourselves, Lord. When, when we are faithless, it says he remains faithful. You never quit, Lord. You never give up on us. You're always pursuing, always pushing, always chasing, always giving, always forgiving. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to receive that grace and trust in that grace so that we can know that even if we made a mess of things, we can stand back up and start moving forward again because you can make all things new. You can change and transform things. So help us to believe that again. Help us to press forward. Help us to take care of the essentials, Lord, to do the things that you've called us to do. And help us that when we're not surrounded by a group of people that are like-minded and see things like we do and have the same heart that we do, to still have the energy and the power and the empowerment coming from the Holy Spirit to keep going. Because even when we're alone, there is the Holy Spirit right there with us, willing us on. Even when we've lost all energy or run out of answers, the Holy Spirit's still right there in the midst of it. And you might not give us the answers right there in that moment. You might not make us feel the energy right there at that moment. But that's the, that's the joy of it, is that we get to journey on this with you. And so help us to become what you've called us to be. And help us to keep moving. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, a number of people in here have been married for many decades. And, and you will probably know and be able to testify to this reality that your life and your marriage and your relationship and your family and your household wasn't perfect, isn't perfect still today. But it's that those people stuck with you, stuck with you through it. It was the joy of the making it through it together that's really made you guys close. Isn't that what usually happens? It's those tough times that really drive us together. We try to get rid of those, but those are the things that make things happen. And, you know, we just sang that the Lord has uh, wide open arms towards us, and he's the God who stays and stands with us. And yet it says that we are his hands and his feet. Doesn't it say that? We are the, the representation of Christ to the world. And so my question for you is, are you giving up on people that are around you? Or are you staying with them? And when I go on hospital visits, you know what uh, people usually want? They don't want me to have all the answers. They don't want me to change everything. You know what they want? They just want me to be there. Yep. Staying with people means so much. And so let's do that, amen? Uh, so when you leave here in a moment, it looks like they're going to sing again. Uh, when you leave here in a moment, uh, I'm going to dismiss you. They'll begin singing. But uh, men, there's some gifts for you. Is, is that ready? Uh, both things, okay. Uh, we have uh, a, a gift packet of coffee for you guys. Uh, it's uh, uh, home brewed from, from a, a friend of mine. Uh, so we have a gift of that for you. And John and the men's ministry also has, and the kids have some donuts for you as well. Uh, so I know, guys that get all the good things, don't they? Um, but uh, that's, that's for you for Father's Day. Uh, thank you for being dads for your family. Thank you for being husbands and staying with them. Uh, and uh, we appreciate you dads. We appreciate you men. And next week we have our, our missionary joining us uh, next week to share with us what's going on in the mission field. So please be there for that. But I love you guys. Thank you for being here. God bless you. See you next Sunday.
Thank you. 